I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome everyone back for our last session of the day. Um, and it's by no mean the least. Um, just to, to add to the wonderful um, meeting, we have um, session four, which is on new international clinical approaches. And we're really privileged to have two international speakers join us. So please take the opportunity to put some questions um, in the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll have some question and answer time at the end of the talks today. So first up, um, we've got the privilege of listening to Professor Roger olufsen Bag, um, for whom it's um, seven o'clock in the morning. Um, he's gonna talk about local regional therapies for metastatic uveal melanoma. He's a professor in cancer surgery at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden and a senior consultant surgeon at Salgrenska University Hospital in Sweden. He has a profound interest in research concerning metastatic uveal melanoma and has pioneered clinical research in local regional treatments with isolated hepatic perfusions, lately um, also combining, combining that with novel immunotherapy treatments. He has a laboratory for which he's doing some really frontline research. So welcome, um, Professor. Thank you for this very kind introduction. It's a um, great honor to be invited to this uh, meeting and uh, thanks to the organizer for putting up with the well-organized online meeting as well. I will now share. There we go. So, um, yesterday it was midsummer in Sweden, the longest day, and for you in Australia, the shortest day. Uh, but we're still up in Sweden, most of us, I hope. Um, these are my disclosures. Uh, and just to refresh everyone, this is Sweden, and this is the incidence of cutaneous melanoma. When I was born, it was like five per 100,000 inhibitants. Um, unfortunately, we are closing in on the numbers you have in Australia as well. Uh, especially in the west coast of Sweden and the southern part of uh, Norway. Uh, and Gothenburg University and Gothenburg is located here on the west coast of Sweden. And I work at the Sargansson Comprehensive Cancer Center there. If we look at, on the incidence in Sweden of uveal melanoma, we can see that from the 60s up until 2010, uh, it's basically a, uh, more or less a flat line. So it's two, as we already know, of course, two very different uh, scenarios. The special thing about uveal melanoma, and everyone knows this, is that a high proportion of patients, up to 50%, develop metastatic disease, and the majority of patients will have liver metastasis. And this is an example from one of the surgeries where you see this multiple liver metastasis. And it's important to, to, to note that even on, if you do a CT and see one or two nodes in the liver, if you actually do surgery, it very often looks like this, a widespread disease throughout the liver. And just to, to give some numbers, because we're going to talk about numbers today, uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, if survival of the diagnosis of metastatic disease. If we go back to 1990s, 1,000 patients that were screened, 145 developed uh, metastatic disease, and the overall survival, or the median overall survival, was four months. In the COMS trial, a uh, highly cited trial in uveal melanoma, there were 2,000 patients followed, 739 developed metastatic disease with a median overall survival of six months. And a more selected group of patients, uh, basically the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center uh, experience, they followed all patients that developed metastatic disease for 10 years, and the overall uh, median overall survival was uh, a little bit longer than one year. So um, you can say that it, six to 12 months seems to be the normal median overall survival for this group of patients. And then we come to the different treatments, and this is not a, this is just a very brief overview. We can say with chemotherapy using tenosolamide, 7.3 months, uh, combination uh, uh, chemotherapy from the Finnish group, 10.6 months. Uh, targeted therapies, there has been a lot of interest in MEK inhibitors. Selimetinib is one example, 10.8 months. Immune checkpoint inhibition, ipilimumab alone, 9.6 months. Combination ipilimumab and nivolumab, 12.7 months. 
Uh, and then we come to liver directed therapies. Uh, there was a European trial, a randomized trial of intraarterial fotomastin versus uh, systemic fotomastin, and that was 14.6 months for the intraarterial. And liver resection, a very highly selected group of patients, 14 months. So here we have spent the last decade, so to say, that these are the numbers we have been uh, working with, six to 12 months, a little bit longer for a more selected group of patients, very likely with liver directed therapies. Um, but we all know the, uh, the uh, revolution, we have to say, or at least the first really important milestone with the introduction of Fubentafast, um, published now two years ago, 21.7 months for Tubentafast versus 16 uh, months in the control group. And now take your pen and paper, write down these two numbers, because you will see that we will actually come back to them. Uh, important to see here is that in the control group, patients either received uh, monotherapy with ipilimumab or uh, another PD-1 inhibitor, the pembrolizumab, or dacarbacine, which is basically timosolomide. Um, so we can also see that the control group did a little bit better than anticipated. Uh, but we're, now we're going to talk about local regional treatments today. Uh, and uh, what is that? That is regional treatment of an extremity or an organ. Uh, here at Salgrenska, we treat patients with intransit metastasis of arms and legs with isolated limb perfusion. We do isolated hepatic perfusion, which I will talk about today. Experimentally, it has also been done for lung metastasis. Um, the idea is to give a high local concentration of a chemotherapeutic agent, uh, most often melphalan and sometimes with addition also of a cytokine TNF alpha. However, this is not uh, in current use for hepatic perfusions. Uh, so the idea is to give a very high dose of chemo to a local part of the body with no or low systemic toxicity. Uh, and you can also have a synergistic effect of uh, hyperthermia. So that's the very background. So how do we do it? Practically, so if we look at the patient where we plan to do isolated hepatic perfusion, we start basically basically by a midline incision. We completely isolate and free the liver; uh, it's just hanging in its vessels. Um, and this is the cable vein. Uh, we introduce a catheter into the cable vein and place the tip behind the liver, and then we place another um, catheter into the hepatic artery. Uh, and this is the portal vein. We connect these catheters to a hot lung machine, which basically consists of a roller pump, an oxygenator, and a heating device. Uh, and then we close off the cable vein and the uh, portal vein. So now we can infuse here and we take the blood that comes out of the liver through this catheter. And we, we uh, basically have isolated the liver from the rest of the circulation. Then we add melphalan in a dose of one milligram per kilo body weight to the system and we perfuse this through the liver for one hour. Uh, after that is finished, we rinse the liver with normal cell iron and then reconnect the, uh, uh, the vascular circulation. Uh, and how did I get into this? This is the first paper from Solgensk in 1994, so it's almost 30 years ago. And these are all my kind of senior supervisors, they are all retired now. Elo Hofström, Stig Holmberg, Peter Nared and Per Lineri still doing their last years of clinical or uh, academic uh, uh, work career. Uh, but they basically tried this. This is, we have to realize that surgery or the surgical uh, research evolution has been a little bit different. So it was a lot of, about trying early on. So they treated 29 patients, 10 with, uh, with malignant melanoma, and, uh, and presented this. And then I got involved in it, started doing it. But then I realized that do we actually have any evidence that we do anything good? Uh, we went through all, the, uh, all of the records we had and realized that for patients with uvular melanoma, there actually seemed to be a kind of benefit, very retrospectively thinking. So then we did a study in Sweden. We just used the pa Swedish patient registry. We identified uh, patients with uvular melanoma that later developed liver metastasis and liver metastasis only. So kind of selected group of patients. 
um, um, and this is from the national registries and this was 135 patients um, and then we identified that 28 of these patients actually had undergone IHP um, not through a structured uh, research program or a trial or just they were referred to it and they had undergone it the selection is unclear you can say and the remainder uh, of the patients were then the control group but of course this is a highly selected patient so then we decided we compare these 28 patients that underwent IHP basically with the longest surviving patients in the control group the hardest control group you can ever construct in a retrospective study uh, and when we looked at the survival for this in the control group the median survival was 15 months and in the IHP group the median survival was 27 months so it's one year difference um, and then we thought if we really believe this and we do think that we do a benefit we have to do a randomized trial to really prove if we prolong uh, survival in this group of patients and that was the kickoff for this Scandium trial, the Scandinavian randomized controlled trial of isolated hepatic perfusion for patients with uval melanoma liver metastasis. Um, very pragmatic trial design. Uh, it was based in Sweden, but patients were also referred from Denmark and Norway to be included in the trial. Patients were randomized to either uh, isolated hepatic perfusion or best alternative care. Um, any kind of drugs or other trials were uh, allowed um, since we realized that this was a moving field now. Importantly, there was no crossover to IHP. Uh, the primary endpoint was overall survival at 24 months. And based on the retrospective data, the hypothesis was that in the IHP group, 50% would be alive after two years versus 20% in the control group. And uh, the secondary endpoints included uh, progression free survival, hepatic progression free survival, response, safety, and quality of life. And the aim was to include 90 patients. And randomization, the best alternative care and follow up was performed at local centers, and patients were referred to this one time treatment of isolated hepatic perfusion uh, here in Gothenburg. Uh, this is what I'm probably most proud of in my career, the inclusion curve. The green one was the anticipated one and the red one for this rare disease with this rare treatment actually just follows this. But of course, a trial like this takes time. We started 2014 and fi uh, finalized inclusion 2021. And as everyone knows, a lot of things have happened during these uh, years. Um, 147 patients were screened, 93 were randomized. Um, Three in each group were excluded after randomization due to inappropriate enrollment or uh, withdrawal of consent, uh, leading us to a, a group of 43 patients that were allocated to IHP, the intention to treat group, uh, and 44 in the control group also the intention to treat. Uh, and if you look in the patient characteristics, they were decently well balanced. Um, uh, of course, they were randomized, so the difference should be due to random. Uh, if we look at the first line of treatment in the control group, uh, chemo 50 or 48 percent of the patients received chemotherapy and 39 percent immunotherapy, uh, 11 percent local ablative therapy, and one patient uh, received palliative care uh, due to rapid deterioration. And this is, of course, also a little bit. Uh, we, uh, since it's a 2014 to 2021 inclusion period, in the beginning was majority of patients receiving chemotherapy and then immunotherapy, although it's also selection in this group, of course. If we look at the response, we can see that the overall response rate in the IHP group was 40% compared to 4.5% in the control group. Uh, and uh, this included also 7% with a complete response. So a high proportion of patients responding to the uh, treatment. Uh, and uh, if you look at this waterfall plot with the individual patients on the y-axis and uh, how much their tumor shrank in percent, uh, you can see that in the control group, almost the red is the control group, almost all patients had growing tumors, whereas almost all patients actually responded in, in, in more or less in the IHP group. And this, of course, translated into a benefit in progression-free survival, uh, 7.4 months compared to 3.3 months in the control group. 
Uh, but then we come to the overall survival. Uh, and we remember that the hypothesis was that 50% of the patients, um, the hypothesis that 50% should be alive at 24 months, it was 46.5, so close to what we anticipated. But we anticipated that 20% uh, would be alive in a control group. It, it was actually close to 30%. So the difference in, in survival, which is um, quite high, 17%, did not reach statistical significance. Um, and now if you look at, the, uh, you remember the Tebenta task of median overall survival, that was also exactly 21.7 months. And that is what we reached in the IHP group. And in the Tebenta task trial, it was 16 months in the control group, here even a little better than that, 17.6 months. Uh, and we can come back to this, why do the control group do so much better now than historically? Um, that's an uh, excellent question afterwards. I don't actually have the answer, but uh, of course things have happened. It's not just selection. Uh, if we divide overall survival per treatment, which is a per protocol analysis, so this is not a randomized uh, uh, results, but rather what the patient received. Uh, we're actually patient randomized IHP uh, that did not underwent the procedure. And the IHP group, then we have a median overall survival of 22.6 months. And if we look at the patients that received immune checkpoint inhibition. They had also a, a similar uh, uh, survival. Remember, this is not randomized, and the, the patients in the chemo group did worse. So, of course, this is not super. This is uh, uh, this is not a randomized comparison, but it's of course interesting to note that patients receiving the immune checkpoint inhibition did better. Uh, and this is the first time anyone actually sees these data. So this is um, first just for you, because we have also analyzed the quality of life uh, using this ET5D. Uh, and here is interesting. IHP is the blue-greenish one, uh, control is the red one. That uh, both groups start uh, with a good uh, quality of life of close to 80. Uh, and then you can see that in the IHP group, it's maintained over the year. Um, while in the control group, the quality of life actually declines, which asks you question about, we have to remember that IHP is a one-time treatment. You treat it once, you undergo surgery, you, you have some weeks to recuperate afterwards, but then you're off treatment. Whereas if you're on continuous treatment, um, which you are if you're on chemo or immune checkpoint inhibition. Um, so I think this is an important thing in the future as well to bear in mind. But um, there has also been parallel research in this, and uh, this is the percutaneous hepatic perfusion, which is basically call it a modern version of this isolated hepatic perfusion. Um, here you do everything minimal invasive from the groin. You start by uh, entering the femoral vein. Uh, you put up a catheter with two balloons, one above the liver and one below the liver. And then you see here, if you see it really close, that there are fenestrations in the catheter. So all the blood that comes from the liver enters these holes and out uh, to the pump. Um, and then you put up another catheter uh, through the femoral artery and find your way through the hepatic artery. And here you infuse the melphalan. So basically you infuse melphalan into liver, you collect the outflow of the liver, you pass the outflow through a pump, you pump it through a filter, so you remove the melphalan and then you give, the, uh, give uh, uh, the blood back to the patient. So this is not a perfusion, you don't perfuse, you rather infuse, you collect and give it back. Um, and when you do this, you give three times higher amount of melphalan uh, since you kind of clear it away, it's not that you circulate it. Um, and there has been a parallel trial to the Scanion trial, the FOCUS trial, a little bit harder to interpret because it's in two parts. The first part is very light, is very uh, similar to the Scanion trial. Patients were randomized, 43 underwent this PHP procedure and 42 had a, a control group um, uh, with these treatments. But then due to problems with accrual, they added on a second part of the 
uh, trial is basically a one arm trial. All patients receive PHP and included 59 of that, in that part. If we look at the patients that receive PHP, uh, either randomized or not, uh, you can see a similar waterfall plot. Very many patients actually responding to the treatment, including a high proportion of uh, uh, complete responders or near complete responders. Um, and they also showed a benefit in progression-free survival, three versus nine months. Um, remember now that this is though for all of the patients. Um, and they had a similar uh, effect in the overall survival, 19 months versus 14.5 months, uh, but it was not statistically significant. So both trials uh, underpowered, you can say, to show if there is a, a overall survival benefit. Um, we did a meta-analysis uh, of all, all the retrospective or phase one, two trials that have been published earlier. So we identified 292 patients uh, in these trials, 128 that has been treated with IHP and 164 with PHP. Um, and the question being basically, which one is better, is IHP or PHP to prefer? And if we look at the progression-free survival, uh, the median PFS in the IHP group was 8.4 months and the, uh, in the PHP 7.2 months uh, without any statistical uh, difference. Um, the overall survival, similar result, 17.1 months versus 17.3 months. Um, the difference though was in the complications rates that in this Clevin did the grade three or four complications was uh, 39 percent in IHP group and 24 percent in the PHP group. Uh, and this was also difference in 30-day mortality, 5.5 percent versus 1.8 percent. Here though we have to remember that uh, this includes the very first trials of both IHP and PHP and I would say today there is basically almost zero mortality. Of course we have learned, we have developed the techniques, uh, uh, but from this you can really say that uh, PHP is uh, probably gives the same results concerning PFS and OS as uh, IHP but with less toxicity. Um, but then, then we come to the next things. How, questioning a little bit, how, how does IHP really work? Is it just killing the tumor cells? Does it matter how we kill the tumor cells? Or is it, uh, or is it actually that we kill the immune cells in the liver that matters? Uh, I will not dwell too deep into this. I just want to show you this um, uh, small experiment. Basically, we took melanoma cells, cultured them, uh, and then we exposed them for one hour at 40 degrees, exactly as we do in hepatic or uh, 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 in, in hepatic perfusion and then we tried melphalan and different types of uh, I just showed mitomycin, mitomycin but we tried different kind of uh, chemotherapeutic drugs or PBS which is basically saline so we basically killed cells uh, and then we injected the kill cell, killed cells into mice we wait seven days so this is called a vaccination thing um, and then we injected the living cells again into the mouse and watched how the tumor progressed. Uh, interestingly, we could see that if you injected one week before dead cells that, and that were killed by mycomycin or melphalan, you actually had a smaller or no tumors developing compared to the control group. Um, but here comes the really interesting thing. Melphalan, compared to other chemo, they induced tumor-specific T cells in the mouse. Um, and most importantly, there was an upregulation of PD-1, uh, pointing towards that you actually had an activation of these T cells. So it matters how you kill your tumor cells. Uh, and it seems that doing it with hyperthermia and using uh, the very old drug of melphalan seems to cause an immunogenic type of cell death. Uh, and together with Jonas Nilsson, who's now a professor in Perth, Australia, uh, also looked at different molecular uh, or driver events uh, in metastatic uval melanoma. Um, and one important figure from this paper is that we looked at patients with even melanoma and looked at their survival and we could identify if you had high amounts of neoantigens they did better than if you had low impressed and tied or 
kind of uh, immunologic scores based on the uh, expression data. And then you can also see that uh, 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 these can, there are immunological factors separating this group of patients. Um, so these findings together with other findings, of course, led us to the Scandium 2 trial. And here I want to highlight Lars Ny, uh, an oncologist at the same hospital. We're a tight group, uh, all of us. Uh, and this is a phase 1B trial where we, uh, now I just have to check my time, yeah, where we randomized patients to IHP followed by ipilimumab or nivolumab, four cycles and then nivolumab in a kind of, we call it the adjuvant arm, we received immunotherapy after the IHP, or we started off by one cycle of immunotherapy and then IHP and then basically the same treatment. The idea here was to look at safety for the combination of IHP and the immunotherapy, but also to a little bit investigate if it was better to give one cycle before IHP. And the hypothesis was that the RMB would be better, uh, potentially also more toxic. Um, uh, there were differences in the arms. I mean, it's a small trial, nine plus nine patients. Uh, so there were more patients in RMB with higher uh, tumor burden uh, and also with more extra hepatic disease. Uh, interesting thing is, though, that in the, if we look at the adverse events for IHP, it was a total of 143 in arm A and 144 in arm B. So no differences basically in the IHP related. Uh, adverse events, but there were numerically uh, more uh, adverse events with the Ipinivo in the uh, new adjuvant arm where we gave it before. Uh, and it's also reflected in the total number of severe adverse events. So it was a little bit more toxic with RMB. Um, uh, but to our fascination a little bit, we have to remember is these are nine patients, you cannot draw two, uh, two big conclusions out of this. But overall response rate was 56% in arm A and 22 in arm B. And the difference is, of course, up here with two complete responders versus one complete responder. And if we look at the spider plot uh, of response, we can see arm A uh, seemed to do, if you just look very briefly on this, it seems to do a little bit better. But very many patients are actually responding in both arms. And notably, there were two patients that did not receive the IHP due to complication of the immunotherapy, the first cycle. Um, so this helps us in designing the next trial, the Scandium 3 trial, which has not fully been decided yet, so that's why I'm not sharing it, but it will be some kind of combination of PHP, we will convert to that due to the less toxicity, and in combination with immunotherapy as well, of course. There is also a parallel trial to this trial, the Chopin trial. Um, they reported the first seven patients, so very low numbers also here. They kind of did this uh, uh, sandwiching techniques of starting epinevo, cycle of PHP, then two cycles epinevo, PHP, one cycle epinevo. Um, and they published the results from the first seven patients. And you can see here quite res uh, impressive uh, uh, responses that seem to be uh, going up to a half a year uh, and is kind of still shrinking. Just one patient that it seems to have stable disease or slowly progressive. And based on these first, they're now entering the phase two of that trial. We, and they are randomizing 76 patients to PHP for this sandwich uh, uh, design. Um, where if you look at the Scandium trial, it might be, be better actually to start with the PHP. Um, and hypothesis, it could be that here you actually kick off the immune system, you stimulate the immune system, and then you basically kill all the immune cells, because melphalan also kills the immune uh, cells, um, and therefore it might be better to do that before. But of course, that is just speculation, no one really knows, and that's why we have to do this trial. So, to summarize, <coughs> um, Patients with metastatic human melanoma, uh, unfortunately, still have a bad prognosis. Uh, uh, IHP and P or PHP gives very high response rates and clear PFS benefits. Um, there's an unclear, I would say, OS benefit. Numerically, uh, the scanning trial showed similar numbers to, to, to Dentafest, but of course you cannot 
really compare these uh, to each other. Um, interestingly, and which has to be uh, researched even more, is of course the quality of life is issue. Uh, one treatment or if for, for PHP you do it twice versus continuous treatment, how does that affect patients? Uh, I would say that PHP instead of IHP is likely the future. This is kind of modern evolution of IHP with less toxicity. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like IHP or PHP alone provide cure uh, we, um, as we have been getting used to in patients with cutaneous melanoma. So there have to be combination treatments. Uh, and that are currently investigated and we will soon hopefully publish the results from the Scandium trial and then we will have the, the Japan trial and then we will have the Scandium tree trials. So there are more things happening. But just looking at these numbers, there are definitely uh, some good things happening with these local regional treatments for this group of patients. Uh, and finally, I would say sincere gratitude to uh, the patients and their families for participating in all of these trials, not just ours, but all trials around the world. Uh, and when we present this data, we have met all of these patients in person. We have shared the tears with the patients and the families, and we will continue to work for a better future. Uh, I would like to extend my gratitude also to the funding bodies of this and, of course, all the collaborators around the world. So thank you very much for this. Thank you very much, Roger, um, for a very insightful uh, talk. And the future does seem bright for the use of those multimodality treatments, maybe getting some synergism. Um, that's wonderful. We'll, we'll hold some questions till the end. Um, and please put those questions um, in the question and answer box there. Um, our next speaker is Associate Professor Amin Kilic. She's talking on genomics and prognostication in UVL melanoma. Um, so uh, Amin has been working in the Erasmus MC Ophthalmology Department in the Netherlands. So we're having another guest from um, Europe. Um, and she's been working there since 2009 after completing her training as an ophthalmologist. Um, Amin has been involved in clinical and scientific research into ocular melanoma as a principal investigator at the Rotterdam Ocular Melanoma Study Group. Um, in 2014, she won a personal grant um, for research into non-invasive detection of high-risk patients and has been an associate professor at the ophthalmology department since 2018. Her areas of interest are ocular oncology, um, which we're looking forward to hearing um, more about, and vitro retinal surgery, um, including the endoresections of eye tumours. So um, very much welcome, Amin, to talk to us today. Thank you very much. It's also for, uh, quite early for me, but just a little bit later than my previous uh, speaker. Um, I want to share my, uh, where is my slide? Oh, I'm trying to share. One moment, my presentation, it was working before. Yes. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to speak uh, on this subject because this is something I really, really find uh, interesting and do uh, um, research on together with a lot of people uh, within Rotterdam and worldwide. Um, I will speak on the uh, genomics and prognostication in uh, uveal melanoma. Um, let me see. Um, the outline of this presentation is a little bit about the hist history of the, the genetics in the UM research, the genes involved in the development of UM, uh, genes involved in progression, some new insights, and eventually I will put up a small summary of uh, all the information I've given. So if we look at the genetics in uveal melanoma, we know that there has been some research in cytogenetics and in the early 90s, um, already uh, uh, pressured from a German group um, published on the prognostic implications of chromosome three and monosomy three in uveal melanoma, where he saw that patients with monosomy three had a worse survival compared to patients uh, with, um, uh, without uh, the monosomy three. So uh, we elaborated, of course, on, this, um, on these chromosomes 
And what we did, because in the early days, we had for every tumor that uh, where the eye was enucleated, we did a little bit, uh, we did some small cell cultures. And when we did the cell cultures, we could look at the karyogram at the chromosomes really and see how many chromosomes there were and which ones were gained or lost. And we did a study where we looked at all these chromosomes and we had over 120 uh, tumors, which we had analyzed. And we looked at all the gains and losses. And what we now know is that loss of chromosome 3Q was very important and occurred in a lot of tumors, but also the 8Q gain and the 16Q loss. And I'm coming over, um, coming up to that later on too. Uh, we also looked, of course, at the survival, and in uh, these early studies, um, we uh, mainly focused on chromosome 3 and 8. And if we looked at, uh, because we did all those karyograms, we could look at the specific numbers of um, gains of chromosome 8Q. And when we looked at these, we saw that if we had more copies of chromosome 8Q, that the patients had worse survival. And that was already published in uh, 2012 and has been done over recently. And nowadays we believe that more copies and more amplification of 8Q is really um, associated with worse survival. And more recently, this publication uh, in Nature Genetics, um, this was published in Nature Genetics by um, uh, Hunter Shane and uh, Jens uh, Kilgard where we looked at the genetic evolution of the metastatic uveal melanoma. And if he looked at, uh, he compared primary tumors and metast metastasis. And um, what's very important is that some, um, uh, from, uh, some chromosomal gains and losses and also gene mutations occur very, very early in the evolution. And one of these is the uh, gain of 8Q which occurs very early um, in the evolution um, while the tumor grows. When we um, go from the, the chromosomes to the genes, because we have known for a uveal melanoma that there have been some gene mutations which occur in the majority of the tumors. And these are the GNAQ and GNA11 mutations. The GNAQ was first described in 2009. One year later, the GNA11 was um, uh, described. And more recently, the PCLV, PLCB4 and the CISLTR2. Uh, but all these are, um, occur in these tumors, but are not associated with metastatic disease, but play a role in the rasra mac erg pathway, which can be um, uh, targeted uh, for treatment. Because a lot of people, a lot of patients, if you look at in our cohort uh, of uveal melanoma patients where we have genetic information, like 100% of the patients will have either one of these mutations. So this pathway is affected and is a potential then target for, um, uh, for treatment. So and once again, if we look at uh, uh, when we try to relate it to survival, we do not see any uh, association with patient survival, they occur but the association is not there. What is associated in with the survival is the mutation in the PAP1. And this has been published by Harbour, where uh, free in metasti metastasizing uveal melanoma, there was uh, in the majority of the patient a PAP1 mutation. And he did some exome sequencing. And the most, most important is uh, PAP1 gene is located on chromosome 3P21. What is this gene? It is a tumor suppressor gene. It's involved in cancer development and a lot of biological processes, such as regulation of the cell cycle and cell growth, and DNA repair, and also the chromatin dynamics. If we look at the um, mutations and where the mutations occur, they can be throughout the whole gene. It can be an N-terminus, can be an S-terminus. They are occurring everywhere. It can be large deletions. Um, uh, large parts of the, uh, the, the gene can be deleted. Um, so you cannot really pinpoint a single mutation which is associated with the worst survival. It is throughout the whole gene. 
Uh, but what is interesting is if you look at uh, it, what a defective gene or a mutation in a gene will result in a loss of the BAP1 protein. So for the immunohistopathology, it is very easy if we have a, if there is a small part of uh, tissue, then um, a negative um, result will eventually say that there is uh, a loss of the BAP1 gene. And um, it isn't 100% because it depends on which uh, BAP1 antigen uh, antibody you use, but uh, in like 95% of the cases, this will be consistent. So also in our cohort, we looked at the BAP1 um, mutation. And if you look at the scheme, then we have the, the inner ring, uh, the gray one is the, the BAP1 and the BAP, uh, BAP1 positive and the BAP1 negative expression. Um, in the middle ring, the orange one is the BAP1 mutation status. So we see that there can be a negative expression, but still be a BAP1 wild type. Um, uh, we look more into these cases and to see how that, what is going on there. And we also see if there is a chromosome 3 loss, there isn't always a BAP1 mutation or um, a, a negative expression. So it can, it's, this can be a little bit inconsistent. But the majority Will, think, will be like a monosomy 3 loss, a BAP1 mutation together with a negative expression. And this is all um, related then to the survival. BAP1 mutation occurs uh, in approximately 50% of uveal me uh, melanoma. And in the other uh, 50, we have a disomy 3. Uh, so, and what happens with the disomy 3? There has been also a publication by, uh, the, by Harbour that uh, in the disomy 3 tumors, there was a recurrent mutation in the SF3B1 gene. And um, approximately around the same time, uh, also in the German group published uh, about the IFAX and SF3B1 mutations in patients with disomy 3. So we think, okay, we have uh, then the sf 3 one IFAX mutation in DICE-3 patients, which can be related to a good survival or uh, no metastatic disease. Um, and I come up with, uh, um, oh, I see I missed a slide, but I, can, I will come uh, to the sf 3 one later on. If we get to the IFAX, IFAX what's IFAX? It occurs, uh, the mutation occurs in approximately 20% of the uveal melanoma, and uh, the gene the IFAX, the, the proteins, pay, plays a role in the initiation of translation in uh, eukaryotic cells. And malignant mutations in IFAX uh, are at the end terminus in the majority of the uveal melanoma. And if we look, the red one are ones are in the UM, and the green one, the gray ones are in other cancer types. So in the other cancer types, you can see throughout the gene and you feel melanoma, they're all uh, located, mostly located in the N-terminal hill. Uh, the function of the SF3D1, it is, uh, plays a role in the spliceosome. It's a uh, part, uh, it's important in the composition of the spliceosome. And what it does, it binds to intron sequences, so we get uh, normal proteins. And then if it doesn't happen, we will get some alternative splicing with uh, aberrant proteins. And then I come to the survival. So uh, what we did is we looked at the survival, at, because in, uh, in Rotterdam, we follow, follow all, all, all our patients. So Netherlands is a bit smaller than Australia is. So we can do a follow-up by ourselves. And if we looked at the different groups, uh, then we had uh, in the patient with a BAP1 expression loss or with a mutation, we saw the worst survival as a 3 v one mutated uh, tumors. These patients had an intermediate survival. So we saw a few patients who had like early um, metastatic disease, but also patients who developed metastatic disease after 15 years of follow-up. And patients with the IFAX mutations, um, 
rarely get uh, metastatic disease. We have now only one or two in our cohort. And um, we also have patients who have no mutations at all, at all and they do not get any metastatic disease. So because we had these data on the, the, we have data on all chromosomes because we do a SNP analysis on all tumors where we have material of, and um, if you look at the, the old chromosomes, we see that we have these three groups with um, loss of chromosome three, which are mainly the BAP1 negative um, tumors. We have the gains of 6P, um, gain of, uh, loss of 6Q, gain of 6P, and the gain of 8Q tumors, uh, which are uh, mostly the uh, SF3B1 mutated tumors and the IFAX mutated tum tumors um, can have aberrations in chromosome six, but mainly have less um, uh, chromosome, less CRVs. And when we look more closer to the um, chromosome six and eight, what we see is that the chromosomes, the chromosome eight have like sharp um, edges where we see gains of whole arms of chromosome 8Q and losses of whole arms of 8P. Whereas in SF3B1 mutated tumors, we can see also partial gains and uh, which also occurs in the, the chromosome in the chromosome six. And why is this important? When we look at um, uh, anaploidy, we see that this occurs more often in the um, SF3B1 actually. The structural variants occur more often in the SF3B1 uh, mutated tumors. And for most of the tumors we had, um, we also had karyograms because in the early days we did um, uh, fish analysis, we did karyotyping. And if we look at the karyograms, like this is a typical karyogram of a BAP1 negative tumor, we see whole arms gains. And if we look at the SF3B1 uh, mutated, we see Small, um, small regions which come extra on other chromosomes, which uh, compares this to, to these structural variants. And this again, about a negative, where we see um, gain of a whole arm of chromosome 6P. So um, more recently, this publication, uh, this has been published uh, the, uh, the integrative analysis of the uh, different subclasses where uh, a lot of tumors have been looked at, over 80, I think, where they did a lot of testing. They had uh, the molecular testing, but they also looked at the gene alterations. They did some DNA methylation um, and they also did mRNA um, sequencing. And they could divide it really nicely into um, two subclasses, the diatomy 3 and the monosomy 3 tumors, where they also had in the diatomy 3, like um, the gene alterations tested, um, and they had also the BAP1 mutations available. Eventually, we, they came up with four subclasses where they divided also the monosomy 3 tumors into two subclasses. And coming from that to the genetic evolution, um, how does it then happen that uh, when does which mutation or which uh, um, chromosome gain or loss, uh, when does this occur? We get back to this uh, very nice paper of uh, Hunter Shane and Jan Skilvat, where they really looked, try to look into the tumors itself and then we see, if we look at the figure here down below, that the mutations that occur very early are like the BAP1 as a 3 one IFOX, but also the, the GNAQ, GNA11 mutation, but also the 8Q gain. And coming from this, they um, made a nice scheme about how the uh, evolution then would work. So in the eye, they had the uh, the, the GNA Q, GNA 11 mutation, then the BAP1 loss, and then the next step would be the 8Q gain. And that would be the moment where the tumor uh, starts um, metastasizing. And this, in, this is interesting because 
if we look at the metastatic disease, the treatment uh, is mainly for, yeah, if we look at the treatment of metastatic disease, you would like to know which, which pathways are um, affected to treat these tumors. So for the previous, if we, uh, the summary is that uveal melanoma is an intraocular malignancy with a, with a strong tendency to metastasize. And the majority of the uveal melanoma contain uh, mutations that deregulate the gene AQ, gene 11 pathway. Um, metastasizing UM are characterized by monosomy 3 uh, um, and or mutations in SF3B1 and BAP1. And understanding the oncogenic mechanism will aid in the um, development of UM specific treatments. But what about early detection of metastatic disease? Because we can understand how it works, but we have to detect these uh, metastatic met, these mets earlier. Because normally now we do like six monthly uh, evaluation by ultrasound. But uh, in, are there any other um, options for it? Last year, um, and then, then the important thing is when does this met, met when does this met occur, or when does its tumor start to metastasize? And there are some old studies that they calculated, and we know that tumors uh, start metastasizing prior to the um, um, prior to the diagnosis of the uveal melanoma. Um, but re very recently, from the group of Gustav Stahlhammer, he uh, published um, and he calculated um, in how many cells are needed to uh, for a tumor to metastasize. And when he goes back from the diagnosis um, to the primary tumor initiation, um, that takes many, many, many years. Um, and in his uh, study, his conclusion was that you only need like four cells um, when you have uh, a tumor cell that can escape um, this, this tissue uh, to start metastasizing. So you need only less than 10 cubic millimeters of tumor for uh, a tumor to metastasize. And that's, um, that's where our uh, screening and maybe our uh, treatment should be um, focused on more on uh, adjuvant treatment instead of treatment when the meds that meds have occurred. So still, if we have the tumor progression model, we know we have the gene AQ, gene A, the mutations very early, then we have the disomy 3 and the monosomy 3 tumors with, uh, with its corresponding metastatic risk. But we... Uh, if we know what mutation the tumor has, then it's easy to screen for patients. But due to the change in treatments of local treatments of many years, we nowadays have less um, primary tumor tissue available for the testing. Of course, we do a lot of um, um, biopsies, but not every patient wants to have a biopsy. And in the early days of before 1960, 1970, um, uh, uh, in, before 1960, enucleation was actually the most uh, um, common way to treat a tumor in the eye. But later on, we got the, the photocoagulation, we got the plaque radiotherapy, mid-70s, the proton B treatment, and um, then the FNABs uh, have been introduced but there are increasing use of cons eye conserving treatments, which is very important, of course, just, just to preserve the eye, even though we cannot always preserve the visual acuity. Um, but nowadays, if we look in general, if a tumor has a basal diameter of less than 18 millimeters and a thickness of less than 12 millimeters, it will be definitely treated by eye uh, conserving treatment. So not always there is then tissue available um, does it matter for the um, survival? No, it doesn't, because the survival doesn't rely on the treatment given by the uh, given for the primary uh, tumor. The, the true tumor can be treated either by enucleation or by conserving treatment, and the survival will still be the same. And even also in our own group in the Rotterdam study, we look at the the 
we have looked at the, the way the treatment has been changed over the years. We aren't a very old department, so we started out actually in 1992, and before that, the eyes were treated elsewhere. But if we look in from, 19, from the 1990s to the most recent year, because in the start of 2020, we started in the Netherlands with a proton beam facility, and we see that the eyes which were enucleated previously because the patients were older and couldn't um, um, send out to Lausanne because that's where we did then the proton beam treatment, then these patients would get an enucleation. And nowadays, these patients are treated with proton beam. So we have less, um, really less enucleations. So uh, as I said before, it doesn't um, have any effect of, on uh, the treatment and the survival. And um, I do not, um, uh, the, the control of localized disease um, do not have any effect. So what should we do then? We should try to screen for metastatic disease very early. And we can do that in, in several ways and we can make use of um, blood uh, biomarkers. And um, how do we do that? We can take liquid biopsies. They are minimally invasive. Uh, we do not have to poke into any tumor. We can use it for diagnosis, prognosis, but also for the monitoring of the cancer. And there are several ways to do that by uh, in circulating biomarkers, which suggest the CBCs, the CT DNA, but also can look at uh, circulating microRNAs and also metabolites. So I give I will give some examples of what is possible. Um, so CTCs are circulating tumor cells. Tumor cells can shed into the bloodstream and they resemble cells in the primary tumor. And they are not necessarily metastatic, although later on you will see, we will, might see an increase during, um, uh, during metastatic disease. So this is the way we do it and we have adopted it from uh, what we have learned from an uh, uh, Australian colleague. Um, so we do the phenipuncture, we do capturement, enumeration, and uh, isolate these. And we have some antibodies available to um, see whether these are melanoma cells or not. So this is, uh, was actually a collaboration with Dr. Beasley and Alan Gray from uh, Perth. And um, uh, where we see if we get uh, a composite that we have uh, a double positive cell, and this is then actually the tumor cell. So the PhD student we have is very um, uh, is very busy uh, cal uh, counting a lot of uh, cells. So if we have a tumor cell, we can identify this. If we look at the CTC levels. Um, what we did, uh, we looked at the onset of the disease and during metastatic disease, um, we had samples and at the time of metastatic disease, we do see an uh, increase of uh, CTCs. This scheme is during irradiation because for what in Rotterdam, what we do is we do stereotactic radiotherapy and it's one of the treatment options. And we do it for five days and at several uh, at onset, but also day one, three, and five, we isolated. Um, we try to isolate CTCs from blood, and when we at day five, the last day of the radiation, we saw a bit of an increase in the CTCs. So that's one option. Another option is uh, to look at circulating tumor DNA, and that's actually DNA of the cells um, in the bloodstream or maybe aqueous humor. Uh, derives from the tumor cells themselves, but it is less than um, total uh, of the cell-free DNA in the bloodstream is from the tumor, um, might be from the tumor. Um, CT DNA can correlate um, correlates more to the tumor size, so might that be an easier follow-up? Um, so I see that uh, the words have been shifted. But this was also in collaboration with uh, Dr. Beasley and Dr. Gray from uh, Perth. At onset, um, there were uh, there was uh, measurable CT DNA, and during metastatic disease, there is an increase, um, and this, of course, um, related with the survival of the patients. 
So um, this is one patient with a tumor inside the eye. And um, at onset, there is nearly no uh, CT DNA uh, detectable and during metastatic disease, uh, there is a really high rise and uh, many copies uh, uh, visible. And then that, that was also, uh, uh, in most patients, was related to the uh, to tumor burden um, and to the size and the volume of the tumor in the, uh, the liver. So that is one way to do to look at CT DNA, look at the specific mutations within uh, the blood. But another way is to look in aqueous humor. And this publication was from uh, the group of Jesse Berry, that's from last year, uh, where she looked in anterior um, chamber fluid um, at uh, the CMVs, uh, actually at the chromosomal makeup of the tumor. And she compared cellular body tumors versus the choroidal tumors. And actually, if I uh, understand it very right, right, she saw in most of the ciliary body tumors, she could identify a chromosomal profile for these uh, um, for the for the melanoma. And when she she also looked pre-treatment and post-treatment, and uh, interesting is it, it, it rises. We see the DNA, uh, the, we see the uh, CT DNA uh, rising, um, but it rises more in the ciliary body tumors compared to the choroidal, choroidal uh, melanoma. So maybe this would be an option for the um, ciliary body melanoma to uh, have this as a liquid biopsy. So what can we? Um, get out of the uh, CT DNA more. We can also look at methylation. Uh, methylation is the addition of a methyl group, uh, which inhibits uh, DNA transcription. And CPG islands are uh, often methylated. Um, and it er occurs uh, early in tumor genesis and can be associated with the silencing of tumor suppression genes. Um, and we also looked at the methylation of CT DNA in peripheral blood, and what we could see, and these are really preliminary data, that um, we could identify a uveal melanoma um, from from a whole group of uh, from a series of patients of patients' blood that was analyzed, and even and when we look into the uveal melanoma, we could identify the BAP one positive of the actually the BAP one negative tumors. So this seems very promising because um, this is just one test, um, but we have to compare it to other samples within. So for clinical use, this is not, uh, um, currently it is not really applicable, but uh, it, it seems very promising. So something that is also very interesting is to look at the plasma metabolome. And that's then we go over to the metabolomics instead of the CT DNA. The plasma, plasma metabolome is affected in, uh, in actually in, in, in all cancer patients. And we know that from other types of cancers, but, uh, um, and we can look at it also in uh, UM. So what happens? Um, the, the metabolite um, patterns, the metal, Metabolites are small molecules, which are, which are a product of the metabolism. And um, because of the disease, the metabolism has differed and uh, it affects, is then di directly caused by the tumor itself. And, or it is a reaction of the body against the tumor. So we thought um, you and patients, even though they have a small tumor, uh, they might have a different metabolic phenotype. And is it then possible for us to predict the prognosis just based on these metabolites? So we did actually a series of patients. We had peripheral blood available and we had also the genetic um, makeup of their primary tumor. And um, we did our first run a discovery and then in a second run, we also took in like normal patients which might have cataract surgery, but we did not have any type of cancer. And we could, we could see a bit of difference between the BAP1 and the IFAX 
mutated tumors within these patients, um, but it wasn't a really distinct um, metabolic phenotype um, because we could not identify sf 3 d one mutated tumor. So and then you have um, you have a test, but we have a little bit of overlap. So we were not very sure. But if we look at the patterns from UM patients versus the controls, this was really distinct. And we could identify then the UM patients based on a metabolic pattern. So in summary, um, UM is an intraocular malignancy with a very strong tendency to metastasize. The majority uh, of tumors have a, a mutation that deregulates the gene AQ, gene A11 pathway, and the metastasize in UM are mainly characterized in monosomy 3 or mutations in the BEP1 and SF3D1. And if we understand the oncogenic mechanism, that will definitely help us in the uh, uh, in development of UM specific uh, treatment developments. So of course, I did not do all this uh, by myself. Uh, we work very closely together, co-PI with Erin Brosens from the clinical genetics department. And uh, within Rotterdam, we work very close also with the eye hospital for um, in our, um, uh, just in our tumor group. Thank you very much uh, for having me to present uh, this data. I mean, um, thank you very much for a really wonderful um, uh, presentation and your dedication and commitment to um, treating patients and finding out these predictive and prognostic markers is just incredible. So thank you. We've um, now got some time for some questions and um, just encourage people to put their questions in the Q&A um, box. Um, I might start by asking Roger um, some questions. So he talked about the improved survival um, seen in um, the Scandium trial. Um, I'm just wondering whether he has any thoughts about those survival figures. Is it, are we um, finding the metastatic disease earlier? Uh, is it the, uh, an effect of the treatments? Is it that we're combining treatments? Um, what, what do you think, Roger? is the reason behind this? Uh, that is a very, very good question. I mean, as I started off by showing in, in the early, we had a median of all survival of about six to 12 months for almost all therapies that we've tried so far. Um, I think it might be a combination. I mean, in the, we now have in the control group in the Bentafast trial also like 16 months. So it's, it's better and maybe it's, uh, Better screening could be one thing. Uh, uh, I can imagine that that is what a little bit happened in Sweden when we finally got a trial for patients developing metastatic disease before we actually didn't have any treatment really to offer. Uh, and then there was basically no point in, in screening patients with metastatic disease. So that might be one thing that is happening now with when we start to get treatments that we think works, immunotherapy, local regional treatment, we start to screening patients better. We are kind of earlier on in detecting the disease. So it's basically lead time bias effect. It's actually not an improved survival. It's just that we find it earlier. But of course, we cannot rule out that we have multimodal therapies now. A lot of patients have underwent a lot of many lines of treatment. Uh, and they might have some small incremental benefit of that as well. So maybe a combination of that uh, explains why the control groups are doing better now than before. Um, also, of course, there's always selection bias into trial, uh, trial designs, um, um, and that of course plays a role too. But that should not have been, sh should not have changed from before. I think so. Yeah. No, thank you, thank you for that. It's probably a combination, isn't it? Like you've suggested. I mean, a question for you. So if you have a patient with um, uh, monosomy 3, is that influencing your surveillance practices? And um, how would you approach um, a patient when you find that? Um, um, I'd be keen to know for um, practices here in Australia. 
Uh, uh, previously, when I started out as, well, ophthalmo as an ophthalmologist, uh, most of the patients did not want to know. And nowadays, uh, because of all the information we give them, they and just at the start, um, at the diagnosis, we already tell them if you have, uh, um, if we treat the tumor, we always have the option to do a biopsy later on after uh, radiation. So uh, a, a large proportion of the patient will still want to have a biopsy. And then we discuss it with them. We do not change the screening because we still do six monthly liver ultrasounds. But I always tell them, if you feel something different than normal, we can do extra lab testing. We can do an extra ultrasound. Just let us know um, if you feel do not feel very well. Because what, we, what I experience is we do this six monthly and then in the, in the middle of the month, three months, we get a call from the GP that the patient doesn't feel very well. And then they do an extra ultrasound. And then it seems that they have liver metastasis. While three months before, we have already done the ultrasound by an experienced radiologist in our center who knows what to look for. So it's really strange, but I try to instruct the patients and we did not change our screening method because also for the SF3B1, but also for that patient with an IFX mutation, we know they still can get very late metastatic disease. So that's, yeah. And if we have these new options, just to look in CTDNA, look at the specific mutations that we know of, that might help um, in doing um, just a simple test instead of having the patient uh, come in, in every six months. Yeah, no, thank yeah. you. I think I think we've got a lot to sort of work through in terms of how we surveil our patients. And we do have those patients who pop up metastatic disease um, that we don't find on our surveillance imaging. Um, I have a question from our um, listeners. So um, this is um, a good question. I mean, I'm hoping to direct to you. Um, Sandra has asked both her brother and sister died of um, uveal melanoma. And she's wondering about um, familial uveal melanoma and what you might have found um, in your research. You know, what we do is uh, whenever we find, uh, we always take a family history. And if we have uh, a positive family history for um, uveal melanoma, uh, um, skin melanoma, skin tumors, um, lung tumors, then we always would uh, try to screen them for the BAP1 predisposition syndrome. So those patients and also the young patients will, uh, will be referred to the clinical genetics department just for the screening. So, and also if there is a germline BAP1, then we will do um, yearly screening for those patients and they will come, we have like a joint clinic this isn't the joint, but we will arrange the um, um, the screening on the same day for the dermatologist and also for the ophthalmologist. So we would try to we screen those patients. Like just okay. I think there are like now international guidelines to screen them on a yearly basis. No, so thank you for that. No, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. That might be helpful for Sandra. Um, so we've got a couple of more questions coming through, which is fantastic. So Matt DeMello um, wants to thank you, I mean, for your great presentation. Was the aqueous liquid biopsy stratified to include tumors with any ciliary body involvement at all, or just tumors limited to the ciliary body? That's a study from uh, Jesse Berry. And uh, when I looked at the paper, they really, um, they had ciliary body involvement. So I think it's very interesting to redo this, this study because they're the first one that has published. Uh, uh, there have been some publications on, on uh, aqueous humor and CT DNA, but they, I think, the real one, the first one to publish also the chromosomal profiles. So this is the first one, and they had uh, ciliary body involvement. So I think that's the answer. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, and another one from Professor Mark Shackleton um, in Victoria, Australia. So, I mean, um, is the mix of mutations linked to the kinetics of relapse? I, either do some sort of um, suggest that patients might relapse earlier rather than later, um, just in terms of guiding that risk for our patients? Is it then the, um, the metastatic relapse or is it the, the local, uh, local recurrence? Because we know it is ah. related to the recurrence. 
Um, because we have done in the uh, past a study also at extraocular extension and to see where these tumors metastasize uh, more often. And we do not really see that. Um, and I do not think it's really related to relapse um, because every if, if there is, um, um, these mutations are actually quite simple. You have like either the BEP1 or the sx one or the IFAX. And sometimes we see a combination, but it isn't that we have seen more relapses in one group versus the other. And we, even if they have metastatic disease as an ophthalmologist, ophthalmologist we still have these patients in follow-up. No, thank you. And any comment to Dagmara and Poprotsky asked whether, you know, these mutations are thought to be more environmental or genetic. Is there a um, different distribution seen around the world? Um, yeah, any any thoughts about that? No, and this is actually, this is coming up. Uh, we have presented it last year at the ISO, the instance of uveal melanoma around the world. Um, and the instance uh, is increasing worldwide a little bit. And there's my, this might be due to the, um, the survival of people in general. Like we have more elderly people. So it, this might be the reason for the instance uh, to increase. Um, I do not think that uh, I haven't seen in any publication that there is a difference in the um, in, in the mutations because in if there is published it doesn't matter in which country then approximately fifty percent of the tumors will either have a bad one or a monosomies free so I do not think that is very different and there have been some publications on uh, environmental risks. And they have been said that uh, maybe welders are more prone to have UM, but you know, we see them also in old people like housewives who haven't done welding. So there haven't been any uh, environmental, environmental risks that have pinpointed to uh, UM. We know there have been some um, SNPs associated with the lighter eye color, and that is then the association with UM. No, thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's um, really, really useful for us. And I had a, I would like to take the opportunity to ask Roger a question, if I may. Um, Roger, if you have a patient presenting with what looks like just a solitary uveal melanoma metastasis, biopsy proven, um, I know you sort of discussed the high rate of finding others, you know, and you might not see them on imaging, but if it's thought to be solitary, um, uh, would you directly just target that as opposed to doing the IHP or PHP um, treatment? Um, it's an, it depends a little bit. Uh, if, there's, if there's one smaller lesion, I actually doubt that that's the only thing you have. That's the vast experience when also trying to do liver resection on these patients that you actually see they are more diseased there when you actually see kind of light. If there is one very big metastasis, kind of slowly growing, and if you just one lesion, you can, you, you could try liver resections. Although I, I, I think it's uh, if we have the trials or we have that we have, I think at least in Nordic countries we would go for the IHP or PHP to uh, to do that, um, because you you will have a recurrence, but there are patients that you can resect. You cannot, uh, you cannot say that there aren't, but I would really do MRI, really try to figure out if there's more disease. Uh, in some few patients, uh, I would say it's an option at least. Oh, thank you very much. Um, look, I think it's just been a really great um, session and have, um, the ability to um, draw the meeting to a close. Um, Professor Anthony Joshua um, has been integral in bringing this all together. Um, he's not um, on the line at the moment, um, but on behalf of himself and myself, um, Mask, um, it's it now time to bring this wonderful um, meeting to a close. Um, I'd like to thank all of the speakers from today um, and also the attendees um, who have hopefully found this useful. I'd like to thank our sponsors, um, Medicine, um, Idea Biosciences, Eckert and Ziegler, 
and the University of Sydney, because without their sponsorship, um, this really um, wouldn't have been able to happen. So also a heartfelt thanks um, to Mask, um, Merrin Morrison and Sam Hogarth, um, and the Mask team have pulled together um, this uh, great meeting. We really hope that we'll be able to meet face to face um, in 2024. It's been online now, but um, the plan is to maybe have a face to face meeting for 2024, which would be really wonderful. So with all of that, um, I'd like to conclude um, OMA 2023. Thank you. <laughs>